Israel under pressure to end so-called automated apartheid. It's accused of using facial recognition technology to control Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. So, how far does that breach their privacy? And does this technology really offer Israel greater security? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Israel's use of artificial intelligence to mass surveil Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, that's the focus of talks this week between members of Amnesty International and EU Commission officials in Brussels. The human rights organisation says that Israel is employing what it calls automated apartheid to build a digital database of the Palestinian population. Former Israeli soldiers say they've been ordered to photograph people to update vast databases. Palestinians say it's yet another invasion of their privacy. Al Jazeera's Laura Khan reports. Military checkpoints, cameras and roadblocks. These are part of the daily reality for Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank. And now Israel is rolling out more digital tools to spy on them. One is a facial recognition technology called Blue Wolf that's described as the Facebook of Israel's occupation. Hebron is considered one of the world's most surveilled regions, but Amnesty says it's now being rolled out across the occupied West Bank. In a report called Automated Apartheid released last month, it said Blue Wolf technology can entrench disadvantages and disempower marginalised groups. So what is Blue Wolf? The Washington Post noted the use of it two years ago. Smart cameras track and recognize people's faces. Israeli soldiers use the technology to take pictures of Palestinians and add them to a vast network compiled through mobile phones. Amnesty International says it creates a gamified system of competition underlying the system. That means it gives soldiers an incentive to compete in creating the highest number of profiles of Palestinians. Israeli forces say the main challenge they face in Hebron is friction between Israeli settlers and Palestinians, and the technology allows them to act faster. And many Palestinian residents say sensors have been installed by Israeli authorities and directed into their private homes and even bedrooms, and that this is just another pervasive technology to show the Palestinians they're being watched. Laura Khan for Inside Story, Al Jazeera. Well, we contacted the Israeli army to ask why it's using AI surveillance technology and for its response to the report. It said it carries out necessary security and intelligence operations while making significant efforts to minimize harm to the Palestinian population's routine activity. The statement also says that the military cannot refer to operational and intelligence capabilities in this context. Let's bring in our guests for today's discussion from Brussels. We're joined by Matt Mahmoudi, Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights Advisor at Amnesty International. He's the lead author of this report. From Occupied East Jerusalem, Jalal Abu Khata, who's a writer and community leader of the Right to Movement Palestine. And in Tel Aviv, Ori Givati, Advocacy Director at Breaking the Silence, a non-governmental organization established by veteran Israeli soldiers. A warm welcome to you all. Matt, let's start with you. Tell us more about this Amnesty report and its findings. Why does Amnesty consider facial recognition a technology that should be banned or at the very least severely restricted? To be clear, Amnesty's policy is that there should be a ban on facial recognition technologies for mass surveillance and for discriminatory surveillance because the technology is simply incompatible with international human rights law. Uh, the technology depends on the curation of a large database uh, without people's knowledge and consent, often scraping their images off of social media and other places, and therefore by design is considered a technology of mass surveillance and therefore incompatible with the right to privacy. We also consider 
considered that it's in violation of the right to equality and non-discrimination because of the inherent bias issues that exist within how the technology is trained on biased data sets, and also because there is a, a pattern of the technology being deployed in racially discriminatory contexts. And finally, because we find that the technology disincentivizes participation in protest, and so it's in violation of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and the right to freedom of expression. So, you know, by, by its nature, we consider it in violation of international human rights law. And as far as the report is concerned, we've been looking at how facial recognition is reinforcing aspects of apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territories, paying particular attention to the ways in which it further exacerbates restriction on the freedom of movement, as well as sort of perpetuating the coercive environment um, that is in place to in essentially force Palestinians out of areas of strategic interest to Israeli authorities and to illegal Israeli settlers. So in this report, we expose in particular the Red Wolf system, which is a system of, of facial recognition that is deployed at checkpoints in Hebron in H2, making it very difficult for Palestinians to pass into areas to access medical care um, services such as uh, work as well as uh, uh, schooling and education. And so you find that, that having to reckon now with an algorithm to access these very basic rights and services are exacerbating the already discriminatory, uh, problematic and, and deeply repressive conditions under which Palestinians just find themselves in, in the West Bank and in places like East Jerusalem. Um, for East Jerusalem, we've looked at the ways in which the Mabat 2000 system, which is now equipped with facial recognition, is being uh, deployed in areas such as Sheikh Jarrah, Damascus Gate, Silwan, and around Al-Aqsa, uh, making it even more difficult for Palestinians to resist the illegal annexation of East Jerusalem, finding themselves increasingly surveilled in everyday tasks, such as attending um, family members or meeting up for coffee. Matt, how, how does Israel's Blue Wolf uh, differ from facial recognition programs that, that, that have been introduced by governments uh, all over the world, the US and India, for example. I mean, most of us are monitored constantly these days by CCTV and other forms of surveillance wherever we live in the world. It's just a fact of modern society today, isn't it? So to be clear, the, the, there's two systems in place currently in Hebron. There's, there's a Blue Wolf system, which is the app-based uh, tool that Israeli soldiers are using to both register Palestinian faces and to also uh, uh, look them up and gather all the information, display all the information quickly and instantaneously as they, uh, for example, stop and frisk a Palestinian individual. The Red Wolf system, which is deployed at the checkpoint, means that now the movement of Palestinian is all, Palestinians are also heavily restricted. What we found in other uses of facial recognition, for example, in New York, where we looked at its usage against Black Lives Matter protesters or in India, is how the technology is used invariably against protesters to diminish the civic space available to engage in, in civil disobedience, in dissent. What's particularly chilling about the way that it's deployed in the context of the OPT is the ways in, it, in which it is governing movement, so literally stifling individuals from being able to access basic rights and services, even in cases in which it's not deployed at the checkpoint, for example, with the Mabat 2000 system or with the Blue Wolf, it's very clear that Palestinians now have to contend with the additional calculus of fear involved in just engaging in everyday activities, increasingly diminishing the spaces available for Palestinians to live. We have uh, accounts and testimonies of Palestinian families noticing, noting how in, in Hebron, the uh, the incursion of, of of facial recognition technologies is effectively destroying any form of social life. We'll hear more of, about what life is is like living <clears throat> under this kind of surveillance from Jalal in just a moment. But first, Ori, I want to ask you about what your former colleagues are telling you about how they feel about Israel's use of this technology. Uh, what is Israel's justification, do you think, for, for using it? So, uh, hi, and thank you uh, for having me, and thank you for also uh, the great work uh, uh, of Amnesty with this report, and we were happy to collaborate. I think that, um, first of all, when we started hearing from uh, soldiers who actually use these technologies in the last few years, we noticed a change. You know, we, we are using breaking the silence in the last uh, almost 20 years. We're working 
to hear about the different ways we control uh, and invade Palestinians' lives, right? So uh, invasion, home invasions, uh, invasions to villages, dispersion of protests, um, and many other you know, military patrols, and all the very, uh, you can say, routine uh, parts of the way we control the Palestinian uh, population in the occupied territories. And when we started hearing about these, the use of these systems, we are hearing about a, basically a new layer of control. Yeah. So if until now we're we've been controlling them only by the in the physical space, yeah, in their homes, in their streets, in the protests, we added another another layer, which is basically controlling Palestinians' digital space. Yeah. So a Palestinian today in the occupied territory is not only uh, feeling like his home might be invaded at any moment, yeah. But also that his most private, uh, you know, personal uh, biometric information is also being uh, controlled by the military. Now, when you talk about justification, you know, and you take different elements of occupation, included, including uh, digital surveillance technologies, the justification is always security. Yeah, when we published together with the Washington Post a year and a half ago, uh, the military said something similar to what you read uh, in the beginning of your uh, introduction here. And that it's uh, in order to improve a uh, Palestinian lifestyle, right? It makes our uh, control better, more efficient, right? If until uh, the use of the blue wolf, the soldiers that they wanted to check, you know, the background of an individual that they stopped in the street, they had to call their uh, base and give the base their uh, ID number and then the, the in the base the soldiers needed to check the system now they take a photo and they immediately have the details yeah it's 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 making everything more efficient mm. um, but this kind of justification can you know uh, the security justification or making everything more efficient uh, this can be used for everything almost we see in the occupied territories and in the end we have to remember what we're talking about here yeah we're talking about millions of people living uh, under under uh, uh, more than 56 years of military uh, occupation uh, in, a co in the context that, um, you know, the Palestinians that are stopped in the street to, and their photos are taken, they uh, can't, they don't consent. They have basically, yeah, until the work, until the testimonies came and other research uh, emerged, they have no idea what these photos are for. Yeah, they can't vote for a political party that is against it. Yeah, they can't vote to, for any party that is related to uh, the way they are controlled. Yeah, they don't vote for uh, the Israeli government. Um, and there are no checks and balances on these databases. Who is maintaining them? Who is making sure they don't leak? Who is making sure they're secure enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay. Taking the military justification and look at what's actually going on on the ground, uh, it's very simple to understand. We're talking about a mechanism of further entrenching elements of occupation and apartheid and not, uh, as the Israel, Israel loves to say, improving the Palestinian lifestyle. Okay. Jalal, um, you've written that you live in a surveillance society which is no different to those uh, depicted in dystopian science fiction novels. Uh, tell us something about everyday life living under such surveillance? What impact does it have directly upon uh, you, your family, your, your friends? It, it starts at home, doesn't it? Even before you've left the house. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think this is the purpose of such a system of intrusive surveillance. Uh, it's something that's always interested me, like how it affects societies and even through reading dystopian novels or watching like uh, movies as a kid, I could imagine the psychological impact such a surveillance society would have on people. And throughout the, pa the past 10 years of my life, maybe perhaps like six, seven years, I've seen this system of super intrusive surveillance being applied uh, and it is part of our every single aspect of our daily life, whether it's on the street, whether it's traveling, uh, seeing family, or even communicating online, our telephones. Uh, the surveillance is, is existing in every part. Of course, um, it is a layer of many layers that Israel employs to uh, cement and entrench a system of oppression, of apartheid, um, of settler colonialism. This is how the, the, the settler colony would dominate and control the population uh, that is, uh, they're colonizing, basically. And, uh, you know, as a Palestinian, as any Palestinian would tell you, 
uh, we already face um, harsh, a harsh reality on every front. Uh, some people are facing um, imminent forcible evictions from their homes, especially in Jerusalem, or uh, the third of Palestinian Jerusalemites, over 100,000 Palestinians who live in construction that's deemed to be illegal by the Israeli authorities. Of course, this is because of systematic discrimination. Uh, people li live in fear in the West Bank, fear for their life, the settlement's expansion, and the violence is daily and occurring in every corner. The fact that there's a, another layer uh, with an even further impact, psychological impact on us, the surveillance system, it, 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 it's supposed to, its purpose is to defeat us, to not resist this violent reality that we live through. They want us to, to put us off from resisting this horrible occupation, this horrible reality. And, you know, when you live in such a society, the, the thing that gives you hope as an as a individual is if you're engaging politically in activism and if you're expressing your views, your opposition of this occupation and apartheid, if you're able to go to, on a march, uh, if you have some basic liberties to protest and voice your opposition to the system. The fact that we don't have even the right to protest in the most simple, basic um uh, unarmed, uh, popular resistance form, the most basic forms, even posting on social media could get people arrested, charges such as incitement. So it's, it's a multi-layered system of yeah. really violent reality that we have to live through. Jalal, you, you also wrote that the surveillance that you're personally subjected to is nothing compared to what residents of Hebron are currently facing. Uh, what, what's going on in Hebron? Why is surveillance so much tougher there? Um, you know, there are many tiers to this uh, system of apartheid. Um, and myself, as a Jerusalemite, we are constantly controlled and monitored, uh, especially in Jerusalem. We are isolated from the rest of the Palestinian uh, communities, especially in the West Bank, through checkpoints, through the wall. Uh, there is a certain reality that us as Jerusalemites, stateless Palestinians, live. We are not citizens of either state. but. We are subjected to a different system because Jerusalem has been illegally annexed in 1980, and we're subjected to a different legal system. In the West Bank, Palestinians who are under direct Israeli control, uh, they are subjected to a wholly different system, a military system, uh, judges with a 99.7 conviction rate. Uh, Palestinians have up close to no rights in the West Bank under Israel's military occupation. Palestinians have little rights elsewhere between the river and the sea, but, you know, in the heart of Hebron, you know, there is a settlement project that is basically in the heart of the city of Hebron. Um, for example, in Nablus, you would you would uh, consider more of the right to movement and the suffocation that people feel when Nablus is besieged, but settlements are surrounding Nablus. Hebron's different. The settlers, they don't number over a thousand, but they are in the heart of the most populous city in the West Bank. And people, Palestinians, they are subjected to the most cruel regime uh, of apartheid. And surveillance is the, the, the top and most obvious layer, you know. You yeah. can get stopped on your way to the shop for groceries. You can get uh, harassed on your way to school. Uh, the most basic uh, acts of life are always constantly affected by the system of surveillance. Ori, wouldn't it be cheaper to relocate the small number of Israeli settlers in uh, the centre of Hebron rather than investing so much in these surveillance technologies? So... Uh... First, I'll continue from where Jalal ended, and I totally agree with him. One of the things we see in Hebron is that it's kind of an occupation lab. Yeah, we see different tools of occupation, not only surveillance tech, but recently uh, very prominently about surveillance tech, start in Hebron. Yeah, Blue Wolf, uh, we know that's already existing all over the West Bank. Yeah, we have soldiers' testimonies from all over the West Bank uh, um, using Blue Wolf. Red Wolf still only in Hebron, as far as we know, but very uh, possible will be expanded to, throughout the West Bank in the future. Um, we also have other types of technologies. You know, recently we saw a, a remotely operated uh, weapon uh, installed in one of the most important checkpoints in Hebron, directed towards the Palestinian neighborhood. And we already know that after it was as, as installed in Hebron, it, it was installed in at least two other uh, uh, refugee camps uh, around the West Bank. So many of the uh, different ways we occupy, ways we control, begin in Hebron and then expand throughout the West Bank. Now, about the settlement of Hebron, you know, um, if uh, uh, um, we look at the way that Israel has been uh, controlling Hebron, 
we can see, you know, Hebron is kind of a microcosm of the occupation. Yeah, you have a settler in the middle of the city, you have 23 checkpoints, you have segregated roads, you have daily home invasions, incursions to Palestinian neighborhoods and so forth, which is exactly the way we control the entire West Bank. Yeah, of course, that if you think about it reasonably, yeah, you would say it doesn't make sense to put a settlement in the middle of the city. But unfortunately, right now, uh, my uh, uh, country, not only right now, in the last few decades, decided that we want to pursue this messianic uh, project. Yeah, and in order to pursue it, yeah, we will establish settlements not only around the West Bank, basically creating a closed zone, you know, surrounding Palestinian cities, exactly like Jalal said, but in Hebron, establishing a settlement in the center of the city um, in order to support this project. You know, of course, that if you think about it reasonably, economically, and so forth, you know, we have so in weekends over a thousand soldiers guarding this settlement. Yeah, of course, it doesn't make sense. But when you look at the politics, yeah, when you look at the at the, at the, at the broader project of the settler movement, yeah. Hebron is a pillar I, of that project. Okay, and just before we get back to Matt, J Jalal, you suspect there's, there's there's something else going on here as well, in that it's not just about the surveillance technology that that the people of Hebron are, to a certain extent. Um, uh, the subjects of an experiment. This is technologies that that, if, that Israel wants to profit from. It wants to sell on. Absolutely, I think Hebron is an excellent, uh, as as Ori said, uh, uh, the lab for AI uh, technology, for surveillance technologies, and as as we all know, the technology that starts in this really oppressive nature in Hebron also spreads uh, throughout the West Bank and. It's promoted and sold elsewhere across the globe as well. Uh, but I have to also uh, point out the fact that also the Gaza Strip under siege for over 60, 17 years uh, is also the lab for Israel's lethal technology, mostly uh, the weaponry, the destructive bombs uh, that have, have caused atrocities in Gaza. Uh, so I see that Israel, the settler colonial project in its entirety, is benefiting from those specific pockets, those labs, and learning exactly how to maintain the system of um, apartheid and colonialism throughout the land between the river and the sea. And what we see in Hebron is felt everywhere across Palestine. We will see in Jerusalem as well. We'll see in Gaza. It's all part of the same idea of dominating and controlling the Palestinian population. Uh, no rights, no civil liberties, uh, quality of life that's always dwindling, no dignity, and just... Uh, I don't know, the most undignified existence. That's the control that the Zionist project wants to have in Palestine. Matt, as we said at the beginning of the programme, Amnesty is meeting with EU Commission representatives. What can the EU do about Israel's use of facial recognition technologies? Are any European companies involved in supplying the technology? Is it illegal for them to do so? And if EU manufacturers are encouraged not to supply such technologies to Israel, they'll simply be replaced by homegrown or Chinese ones, won't they? So the two companies that we identified were TKH Security and Hike Vision. TKH Security is a Dutch surveillance manufacturer. They're one of many companies that are operating slash have products available that are of high likelihood of being used together with the Mabat 2000 system in East Jerusalem for surveillance. Uh, the EU AI Act, which is a landmark AI legislation currently under negotiation at uh, the EU, is a one avenue through which we can challenge the ways in which these technologies are currently supporting and enabling the scaling of apartheid policies against Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories. We've been particularly concerned with what it would mean to potentially increase the prohibitions and what we class as being prohibited under the EUAI Act, such that a proposal that is suggesting the banning of export of any technology that would be deemed as prohibited in the EU context from being exported to uh, uh, the Israeli authorities uh, or any other uh, uh, state outside of the EU context for usage for human rights abuses elsewhere. So if we can get the AI, AI, the AI Act to a point under which 
uh, for example, retrospective uh, remote biometric technologies would be prohibited. We would also be in a situation in which hopefully, uh, with some courage, uh, the uh, technologies that would be used for, for these purposes in by Israeli authorities uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories could also be prohibited. As for whether the Israeli authorities might find another avenue for uh, supplying themselves with uh, technologies that can be used for facial recognition, of course, there may be other avenues and they may even be homegrown. However, by a weakening the, 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 the supply of hardware that is used together with facial recognition, recognition systems uh, that are being supplied from the EU and from, from elsewhere, uh, especially given obligations that these companies have under the UN guiding principles, for example, to ensure that they have human rights due diligence in place, that they are not, that their products are not, for example, uh, supporting and enabling international grave crimes, that we can create a non-permissive environment for companies to engage okay. with but, helping the scaling of apartheid but, policies. But Matt, the settlements are illegal, the wall is illegal, this surveillance we're discussing is part of an illegal occupation. Israel's just going to ignore any outcry, uh, an amnesty campaigning on this issue, like it always has. You're shouting in the dark, aren't you? It may well be that we're shouting in the dark, though, of course, the amnesty, uh, the motto tends to be that that it's uh, it's better to, to, to light a candle than to curse out the darkness. And in this case, I think that's very true, because as we begin to make it more uh, non-permissible to engage in the supply of surveillance technology, as we begin to create almost a repugnant market, as it were, around the supply of surveillance and AI technologies, making it distasteful and, and, and public knowledge that indeed human rights violations are, um, are being effectuated by the usage of AI technologies in places like uh, Palestine, then we begin to make it more possible to weaken the system and to indeed bring even trials outside of the context of, of, of Israel and Palestine to the floor. I think it's very important that we begin to shine a light on how technologies that sometimes can seem a little ephemeral or hard to grasp are leading to real human rights consequences everywhere. And indeed, I think in the European context, there should be some uh, cause to rethink and, and stop and take a pause and consider what it would look like to have technologies that are restricting the freedom of movement deployed here, because that is what we're okay. seeing the natural conclusion of. Um, Ori, I've got about 30 seconds left, uh, so a quick answer, please. Is, is any of this pressure going to make any difference? Does, does Israel care? Uh, look, unfortunately, right now, with the most ultranationalist uh, government we've ever seen, uh, and I'm saying this as an Israeli, uh, the EU, uh, our friends, you know, even also the US are not doing enough, you know, not to protect Palestinians and also not to help our society. But we definitely believe that we and organizations like Amnesty must keep doing this work, bring this reality into Brussels, into the states, because eventually we will believe that they will take action. We just need it to be as soon as possible and not wait like they are waiting right now. Gentlemen, there we must end our discussion. Many thanks indeed to, to you for being with us. Uh, Matt Mahmoudi, uh, Jalal Abu Hatta and uh, Ori Gavati. And uh, as always, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time by going to the website, altazero.com. And for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here, we'll see you again. Bye for now.